live stream wherever you are and so in our minds we realize and remember recognize that we are all together in that realm beyond time and space and together we all take a deep breath and we close our eyes <clears throat> we see in the middle of our mind a little ball of golden light and we watch this light as it begins to grow larger and larger until now it covers the entire inner vision of our mind we see for ourselves within this light a beautiful temple we see a garden that surrounds the temple and a body of water that flows through the garden we see that the inside of the temple is lit as well by the same beautiful golden light and here we are for we have been drawn together by the power and in the presence of God. We devote our time spent together, all of our relationships and experiences of one another to him. We pray that his holiest spirit be upon us, reaching into every thought and every feeling and lifting us up above and beyond all regions of sorrow, limitation, and fear to the endless love and peace that lay beyond. And so it is, together, we all say, Amen. <clears throat> so last night, I got home, I turned on television, and I watched what was going on with the California primaries, and I watched Hillary Clinton's speech, and then I stayed up uh, quite late to hear Bernie Sanders' speech. and. It was the newscasters afterwards who I wished would just shut up. <clears throat> and I uh, recalled uh, Princess Diana's funeral. And I was watching it on television, and you just wanted the newscasters to be quiet. Now, by the way, it's their job to talk at that time, I realize. Um, but I remember if you just turned off the the sound when Princess uh, Diana's, you know, when the casket and the catafalque was going down the street and all the people in London in silence and all you could hear from the people uh, from London was the clip-clop of the horse's hoofs and it was very profound and you just wanted to be with that profound silence. And you, if you just turned off the, the sound, then you, it wasn't the same. But you wanted so much for the newscasters. And I'm, like I said, it was their job to keep talking. But I, I wanted so much to experience the silence. And I'm reminded, you know, one of Buddha's uh, principles in the Eightfold Path is right speech. And right speech sometimes is no speech. Gandhi said, only speak if it improves upon the silence. But there's a reason why silence is significant. Because in what the Course in Miracles calls the holy instant, the holy instant speaks to a plane, speaks to a realm that is beyond time and beyond space. It is beyond sound. It is beyond form. And when we allow ourselves to enter into that space of no thing, that space of no thing is the realm out of which all things emerge. And when we allow ourselves to dwell in the space of no thing, that gives that emptiness that realm of, which is really the Zen quality when they talk about beginner's mind in Zen Buddhism, that you present the empty rice bowl and allow the Tao to fill it up. The idea that we, we not fear, you know, our society is so distracted and there's so much chit chat and there's so much meaningless chatter that we are not hearing the important things because the important things do not come from the, le the level of sup superficial talk. And the important things, we often hear the important things far more easily in that place of silence. Now, we talk often about how, 
you and I have a choice. All people have a choice. Whether you're going to play life at a shallow level or at a deep level. You know, you have circumstances, but it's not circumstances that determine our experience of life. It's where we choose to stand within the circumstance. Now, the universe, as we say here often, is both self-organizing and self-correcting. So the universe knows how to form the next best thing. And so when you stand, when you make your attitudinal ground, what the Course in Miracles calls the holy instant, that space of nothing. And that's why in meditation, it's a quieting of the mind. Not only is that a space from whence comes the next best thing, but it's also a very significant space, not only of calibration, but of correction. For instance, last night, that was a big thing for people who, are, uh, who voted for Hillary. It was also a big thing for people who voted for Bernie. Uh, there's a real big what happens now in the air, right? So the, the consciousness level, really, of your, of your standard mainstream media went right to the horse race. And so that was why, at the end of Sanders' talk, if you went right to that level of conversation, we're talking about one of the grandest experiments that has ever existed on the planet. That is what American democracy is. One of the grandest, most glorious experiments that has ever existed. And you're talking about forces in our generation, as there have been in every generation. This is the contest that defines the political journey of the United States. We are a society, we are a, a country that was based on a profound dichotomy. On one hand, you had the most enlightened principles that have ever been enshrined in the founding documents of any nation. And yet, those principles themselves take something like life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Look at how many of the people who actually sacrificed th their own safety risked their lives to sign those documents were themselves slave owners. So that dichotomy has always existed. It's in our DNA. So our ideals, as magnificent as they are, have never been what we fully embodied. The journey is that in every generation, there are those who, who struggle to more fully embody and manifest the ideals. And in every generation, there are those who would withdraw the political and economic resources of the country from that effort. And that's, that's a continuing journey, generation after generation. Now, over time, we have tended to self-correct. So here you have a nation that has slaves, then you have also a nation that then abolished slavery. You have a nation that did not allow women to vote, but a nation that ultimately gave suffrage to women. A nation that then had white supremacy, institutionalized white supremacy, but a nation that then <clears throat> abolished uh, institutionalized white slavery through the civil rights movement. You had a nation that did not allow full uh, rights to gay people. Then you had the struggle for marriage equality. So you see how it goes. So last night, no matter where you stand, this is a deep, important conversation. Do you know what I'm saying? And so the conversation, the tenor of our, of our culture, particularly now with the internet, is to take everything to the most superficial level, to take everything to the, to the horse race. And those issues like whether or not to abolish slavery, it's not a horse race. Whether or not to give women the right to vote, it's not a horse race. It is a deep, serious issue that affects millions of people's lives. This is part of what happened when we went to war with Iraq. The nation didn't get into a deep conversation. It was this rush to craziness, this war fever. And this is in our own individual lives. I know in my life, when I look at the biggest mistakes that I've made in my life, I was rushing. I was moving too fast. I wasn't, I wasn't thinking deeply. I think of one thing where for years in my tears, I thought if only I'd waited till Monday. I mean, there were things, I mean, things in all of, our, of all of our lives. And so what we have now is a culture. And so we as individuals, if there is to be a wisdom culture, and the evolution of a wisdom culture, you know, a, a collective moves in the same way that an individual moves. 
if you, you, you have free will, we can think whatever we want to think, we can act however we choose to act. That's what free will means. But it says in A Course in Miracles, there is a limit beyond which the Son of God cannot miscreate. What does that mean? What it means is that if you're going in a dysfunctional direction long enough and intensely enough, it stops working. We've all, who of us hasn't been there? And you know, you bottom out. And when you're talking about countries bottoming out, you know, that's not a funny issue. Because, you know, it's like when people say about the environmentalist movement, people will say, oh, Marianne, don't worry. And, you know, the planet will be fine. It's just that, you know, it might have to kick us off for 250,000 years. Um, funny till you think about the amount of human suffering and animal suffering uh, that would accompany such a scenario. So this sometimes is not the question is not first, what do I do? Because you don't find deep answers in life until first you're asking deep questions. And you're not going to ask deep questions in your own life, and you're not going to ask, we're not going to ask deep questions together unless we claim for ourselves the attitudinal field of wisdom and quiet. And that is a level that you are not going to get support from, from a lot of the distracting media of the society. And that's why spiritual growth involves lifestyle decisions. Lifestyle decisions such as whether or not you meditate when you wake up in the morning, whether or not you're going to have the television on all the time, whether or not you're going to be on the computer too much, whether or not you are going to engage in kind of, you know, we all have escapist entertainment, we all have escapist things that we read, but at a certain amount, you know, a certain, uh, uh, a certain point, you know, even like reading a novel, reading great literature, it purifies the mind. Real art is a purifier. If you go to a museum, if you watch a really great film, or you read a real great book, it's not just reading spiritual books. You know, one of the things that we were talking about last week was when in, in, the, in the Old Testament, when God says uh, to the Israelites, I will make of you a nation of priests. And the Israelites in the, in the Bible symbolize the human race. They are that channel. And the human race make of us a nation of priests means that everyone is being drawn to that highest place within whatever field of endeavor you are drawn to, whatever your dharma is. So whether you're an artist or a business person or a scientist or whatever it is that you are moved to do, you are being drawn upward. You know, the word Moses means to draw out. Uh, in the Talmud, it says that there is a, it's an angel bent over every blade of grass, whispering, grow, grow, grow. And so nature is always is always impelling us. We are always being called. The Course in Miracles says, many are called, but few are chosen, means everyone is called, but few care to listen. And that's, that's the problem. It's not that God's not calling to you all day. It's that the ego, the Course in Miracles says, which is the force of consciousness that repudiates God, repudiates love, repudiates wisdom, repudiates truth, repudiates you, right? It is the addictive mind, the addiction to fear. That mind, the Course in Miracles says, speaks first and speaks loudest. So we meditate in the morning. For those of us who are Course in Miracles students, that means we do the workbook lessons, uh, transcendental meditation. There are so many forms of meditation, but serious paths of meditation techniques. There are so many different ones. The point is that in an actual meditation practice, you actually emit different brain waves. And so you can hear what in both Judaism and Christianity is called the small, still voice for God. Now, 
We all have, you know, sometimes people say, how do I, I don't hear the voice for God. But people talk all the time about the committee in your head and the negative voices in your head. Uh, you, you know you have negative voices in your head. All we're saying is that if you, if you allow your mind to be silenced, you would hear all the beautiful voices in your head, the, 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 the intuitions that lead you correctly. Now, in that place, that holy instant, that place of no thing, that holy ground. And remember, your whole mind is your holy mind. You find, but the, the world in which we live cuts up your mind. It cuts it because it, it is constantly tempting us into judgmental thinking and defensive thinking and anger, anger and defense and all those things which cut into your holy, holiness. Because when I am in a place that is not loving, I'm not being my true self. You know how sometimes people will say, well, I saw that person. Uh, he wasn't so nice. I've seen what he's really like. Well, actually, if you saw him in a moment when he was not nice, you didn't see what he's really like. You saw what he's really not like. But what in that moment the stress or the confusion or the fear triggered in him, right? So in that moment when we are in our whole mind, we, we do hear the voice for God. And we are pushed from the back by angels. And we just have a more correct, our thinking is more productive, it's more functional, it's, it, it's more apt to be leading to the behavior that would build good relationships with other people, attracting help from other people and kindness from other people and all of that. But the universe, as I said, is not only self-organizing, it's also self-correcting. So last night was a perfect example. What happens now? And these questions of what happens in the life of a nation is important. You know, I, you know, I ran for Congress myself two years ago. My, I obviously have a lot of passion about uh, political issues, and uh, you know, I'm I'm on Facebook on my public page and. And, and it's, it's important for me because I, it, it's an interfacing, you know, with a real conversation. And I got some emails, and I've certainly gotten it before. I'm not watching your live streams anymore because you shouldn't talk about politics. And somebody saying that they, they don't want to hear from an author or an actor about politics, which I thought was so funny. You know, Sultan Eason, the, the great uh, Russian author, said a writer is a government in exile. So if... <laughs> If anybody should be, should be talking more about great uh, uh, issues of our day, I believe it is uh, artists and, and, and authors and so forth. Because, you know, those, if you have a clue as to what changes one heart, you're the one who has a clue as to what changes the world. So when you're talking about something like millions of people who are slaves, when you're talking about something like millions of people who are disenfranchised from the system and could not vote, even though they were the half of the human race, these are huge issues that have to do with not only the lives of those individuals, but with the evolution of the human race. So I agree with, with uh, President Eisenhower, who said politics should be the part-time profession of every American. Those of us who are seeking a more spiritual perspective in our lives, God did not send you to the world to deny the darkness, but to transform the darkness. And there is a difference between denial and transcendence. So the idea that I'm, you know, some people say, oh, well, I'm just too spiritual. I, I, I don't want to get involved in all that stuff because it's just so toxic. There's nothing, there's nothing holy about complacency. You know, I remember when I was a little girl, and I was at Sunday school, and they took us into the, to the, to the sanctuary, and the rabbi was talking about the Vietnam War. And I was just old enough to, like, get what that meant. And I was so impressed, and I think it was one of the first times in my life that I was really moved by what clergy can be. And he was talking against the war. And I was so inspired, and I thought, this is so cool that he's so hip to what's happening, because I was hearing about it in school and all of that. And then during that week, I heard my mother at dinner one night say to my father, oh, there's a lot of stuff at Temple this week. People are really upset with Rabbi Malev. Apparently, he really said some stuff about the war that offended some people. And then, you know, later, I 
I worked at a spiritual center, but a church, we called it a, a spiritual uh, center in, near Detroit. And that was my first experience of anybody telling me what I should and shouldn't say up on the, the dais and all of that kind of stuff. This is why I've been so impressed by Pope Francis, um, bringing back the tradition of social justice because the, the, the world of the spiritual seeker, the world of the artist, if we're not to be the, the conscience of a nation, who is? If you've got a news media that has been so poisoned by a new economic bottom line, you, you, you've got so many institutions that many of us grew up to think were the great, the great holders and keepers of that which is sacred that have been so, uh, so poisoned and so compromised with this unfettered, you know, I'm, I'm certainly, I, I'm a capitalist, but there's an unfettered capitalism, the way that, that, you know, just capitalism having swerved from all ethical center. Who is going to be the keeper of the deeper conversation, if not those of us who choose to be part of the deeper conversation? So the universe is self-correcting. So anytime, you know, I was reading in A Course in Miracles lesson the other day, about how the mortal mind, the, the ego mind, perceives events. But the spiritual mind extends beyond the level of events to that level of no thing. So you and I see Trump, and we see Hillary, and we see Bernie. But even if you look at those things, just even from a Jungian archetypal perspective, they're all fascinating characters in, what they, in terms of what they symbolize in terms of the American psyche, actually. But even beyond that, these are just events that like bubble up on the surface. So the big question, what happens now? Remember, the Course in Miracles, well, the Course doesn't say these words, but the philosophy is that number one, the universe is self-organizing, but also self-correcting. This is true in your individual life, and it's true in our collective experience. It's like a GPS. If you take a wrong turn, then the GPS will just recalibrate to take a different route. Now, there is a phrase that is used in a lot of uh, old, very old metaphysical literature, and it's called the great work. Now, it's a fascinating concept, and I remember in the Seth books, Seth, the term that Seth uses is the speakers, and it is the notion in the Course in Miracles, this is not a concept specifically related to the Course in Miracles, although it certainly parallels the philosophy. And that is the notion that in every generation, there are those who are the keepers of the great work in every generation, in every area. And so, and that there is, I love how in the Course in Miracles it says, it talks about the plan of the teachers of God. And the Course in Miracles says, that is God's plan for the salvation of the world. They come from all religions and no religions, they are those who have heard the call. And this call is clearly going out. It is clearly being hearkened to. It is not unique or monopolized by any one particular area of the world or any one ethnicity or one sex or sexuality. It is coming up from the bottom of things. It is those who have heard the call. And that call is to a different kind of thinking, a different kind of mindset. The Course in Miracles says that none of us have any more capacity than anybody else. All of us are imbued with the mechanism by which we have a direct radio link to the voice for God. So the universe is self-organizing and self-correcting. So if America swerves, or your life swerves, or the human race swerves from that self-organizing, positive and pro productive line of development, the universe does recalibrate. The universe knows how to self-correct. But you have to go into the holy instant. You have to go into the silence and allow that work to occur within you. And that's symbolized by those 40 years that occurred between the time when the Israelites were enslaved 
and, 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 and delivered by Moses to the time they entered the promised land. It is symbolized by the three days between the time when Jesus was crucified and he rose. Now, there is a line in the Course in Miracles that I think is one of the most amazing lines, and this is it. Only infinite patience produces immediate results. Only infinite patience produces immediate results. So the issue of stillness is that it's a muscle. It's an attitudinal muscle. So it is not just when you're feeling calm. It is a muscle you build for when things are not calm. And when it comes to this presidential election, I think that that's certainly an example. And I don't mean, you know, these days we're very into numbing ourselves with artificial calm agents. <laughs> right? That's not calm. That's, that's not calm. That is just the, the numbing of, of the mind. And, and you will ultimately pay a price for that. Right? Remember, it's not like if you feel anxiety, you're alone. The society is an anxiety disorder. And it's an anxiety disorder because the world in which we live is dominated by thoughts that are bound to make us anxious because they posit that we're not one, that we're separate, that we're not here to collaborate with each other, we're here to compete with each other, that there's not infinite abundance, there's only so much to go around and we have to struggle to get ours. The world is dominated by thoughts that in fact are depressing. So the fact that people are depressed means that they are s simply recognizing and reflecting what is going on that we have gotten to such a dysfunctional place. A serious spiritual life is a conscious repudiation of the thought system that dominates this world. The Course in Miracles says you cannot do this by yourself. You might not be a Course in Miracles student, but you cannot do it, the Course says, without a serious spiritual teacher. Now, the teacher in A Course in Miracles is not an external person. The teacher in The Course in Miracles is called the internal teacher. The Holy Spirit, Jesus is one face of this, and The Course in Miracles does not claim to be for everyone. But this is a time when for us to truly dwell in the quiet, in the deep quiet out of which all that is good emerges, in that deep space of holiness out of which not only the next best thing emerges, but the next formation of love emerges. Like if you look at this thing with Trump and Hillary and Bernie, anything could happen. And not all of it's good. I mean, this is, this is no joke here. When you think of the conventions coming up, serious people are not just talking the horse race. Serious people are taking this in and, and realizing that, that, that things are, are too, everything's so, so, out of that superficiality arises disjointed, anxious things. And that's when in our own individual lives, mistakes happen. And it's when in our collective lives, things can happen that are similarly disruptive. And when you're talking about disruption among many people, and you're talking about all of the superficial thoughts, and you're talking about all the mistaken to the point of violent thoughts and things being said, and how many people have guns in America. This is, this is the time for very sober people to be very sober. And by sober, we don't want to forget that there was, you know, it's kind of like gay. There was a word gay before we used it, for, you know, as in gay, and there was a word sober before we used it as in sober. So th there's two meanings. So when I talk about sober, sober also has a meaning beyond just sober as in you were, you know, addicted to drugs or alcohol. We must all be emotionally sober right now. We must all be down with what's really going on. But what's really going on is that God is. Now, some people say, well, God is, so it's all going to turn out okay. No. No, that's, that's not it at all. It's like I loved it once. I think it was Matthew Fox that did this. I'm not sure. Um, but I think it was Matthew. There was, um, there was a retreat center headed by um, uh, 
a monk spiritual teacher person. And the monk spiritual teacher person, as it turned out, uh, had uh, way too good a time with way too many of the girls who used to come to the retreat center. So, so they, they sent the, the, him away. And, <laughs> and, and I think it was Matthew, I think it might have been someone else, but I think it was Matthew, who came in to kind of process with this group of people who were around the retreat center about, um, you know, what had occurred. And one woman stood up and said about this monk who had such a good time, um, well, he did the best he knew how to do. To which Matthew responded so perfectly, no, he didn't. <laughs> and I think that that's so significant. And similarly, when people say, well, if it's happened, it was what was supposed to happen. No, the Holocaust was not supposed to happen. Slavery was not supposed to happen. Human actions and human choices allowed it to happen. And in the case of slavery and in the case of the Holocaust and in the case of so many things like this, it wasn't only a matter of the people who perpetrated the problem, but also a matter of the people who remained silent when the perpetration was occurring. So there is nothing beautiful or holy about the fact that, well, I wouldn't do that, and then you just sort of check out. You know, that, that's, as I said, that there's nothing holy about that. We are here to be the light. We are here to stand in the midst of the craziness. And right now, that craziness, you know, I was talking to a group of people last night. We were talking about Buddhism. And you know, it's very easy. It's very easy for those of us who are in rooms like this and have the kinds of rights and privileges that everyone in a room like this has. We, we live in an advanced Western democracy. We might have problems in our lives, but these are very high class problems compared to really the majority of people on the planet. Well, it's very easy for us to get very insular with our spirituality. It's very easy. Oh, it's just so pink and beautiful. It's so easy for us to actually, we don't want to take on issues like, ooh, do we have to talk about police brutality? Ooh, do we, do we have to talk about criminal justice in private prisons? Ooh, do we have to talk about income inequality? Ooh, do we have to talk about whatever it is, right? And yet the call of the holy, Moses was sent to rescue the slaves. You know, when Buddha was living in his father's house, when he grew up, because his father had been told when Buddha was born, when Prince Siddhartha was born, his father was told, your son is either going to be a great military commander or a great, a great uh, religious leader. And he said, I don't want my son to be a religious leader. I'm going to be a king like me, a big military commander. And so he put in the palace only those things which were so wonderful that, the, that Siddhartha would never want to leave those walls, never want to leave the compound, never want to cross over. But as he grew up and became a man, something in his heart was very restless, and he knew there was something more. And one night, he jumped up and he went over the walls, and that was when he saw suffering and aging and death for the first time. And that was what ultimately led to his path of enlightenment. And Moses didn't say, oh, thank God, I'm out of here. The burning bush said, no, you're going back to Egypt because your people are enslaved. Moses didn't say, oh, thank God, my mother put me in that basket, and then I got raised by the princess in the palace. They don't even know I'm a Jew. This is fantastic. I can... <laughs> no, God, he was touched. He was touched because it was his, you know, it was interesting about Moses being a Jew because he could have just, you know, he was raised by the princess. He could have escaped all of that. He was not enslaved. But his, something in him knew, something in him, this were his people. God is not separate from your people. Mo Buddha saw suffering people. Moses saw suffering people, and Moses actually killed the, 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 the slave driver who was beating the Jewish slave. And then he had to run, run into another country to escape. And then God spoke to him from the burning bush and said, you're going back, and you're going to free those people. And Moses and, and Jesus, of course, this was very, what more human experience can you have? And that, than that he said and did things, nothing that hurt anybody, but that earned him torture and murder on the cross. These spiritual transmissions do not lead us away 
from addressing human suffering. And when you're talking, that's what matters. When you're talking about the great political issues, I'll tell you why they matter, because human beings suffer. And, and that we would, from, from some spiritual high horse, go, oh, it's just so toxic. I know some woman, I love this. I love this. One woman wrote on my Facebook page recently um, about, um, I posted, I don't know what it was, but something about something going on. And what were her words? Something like, this is getting old. I, this is enough of this. I'm unfollowing you or something like that. And I said, yeah, I bet it's getting old for the people in Iraq too. I mean, it's getting so old. <laughs> it's just like, this is so old. Like, unfollow. <laughs> so, these are... I, these are times for us in our own lives and collectively to be creating not only allowing ourselves to co-create with God, but to co-create with others a space of, of holiness. And holiness it was not, it would not have been more holy for Buddha to stay in his father's house. It would not have been more holy for Moses not to go take on the Pharaoh and lead the people through that journey. It would not have been more holy for Jesus to just, I want to sit this out. The spiritual seeker is here, as I said before, to be what the Course in Miracles calls the teacher of God. To teach is to demonstrate. And that means wherever you are assigned, wherever your heart sends you, and that means wherever you have passion. If you're passionate about food and the food revolution and more conscious eating, that's your assignment. If you're passionate about sex trafficking, that's your assignment. If you're passionate about making films, that's your assignment. And then I do think that politics is a collective assignment. So we're all assigned to that one in this season. And our, our political consciousness in this country is so about the horse race. Our, we are not given, you know, there used to be and have been at times, uh, even on mainstream media, uh, people who held a very deep conversation. And we are living at a time where everyone has been forced into such a shallow conversation that the, if we're going to have a deep conversation, it's going to be because you and I have it. And there are so many ways, whether you're at a dinner party uh, or wherever you are, that people do not want to have the deep conversation and you will find them resisting. You know, one of the things that I absolutely love as I'm, I'm in Ubers, I'm cabs, subways, airplanes, and I'm always asking people, well, who do you think should be president? And anytime somebody says, oh, I don't talk about that, that creeps me out a little, because this is America, and that means we can talk about it. You know, somebody was telling me she was visiting an Arab country, and a conversation came up, and she asked, and the man said, it is not for me to say. Well, he lives under a dictatorship where he can't, you and I can't. And one of the beauties, one of the things that I find when I am traveling, and you know, you're sitting on an airplane next to somebody who you would never necessarily meet in your life, or in a car, or whatever. And what I am always so moved by is how smart people are, and how decent people are. And I've heard people who say they're for Hillary, I've heard very smart people who say that they're for Trump, and the reasons why. If you, because our job is to be in neutral, just be in neutral. The Course in Miracles says, you know, well, Martin Luther King, I love Martin Luther King's line, you have very little morally persuasive power with people who can feel your underlying contempt. So if you're sitting listening to somebody and, you know, and you're thinking that they're wrong, then there's n nothing that can happen positive from that conversation anyway. But for me, what always touches me is how good people are and how intelligent people are. And if you just are talking to people out on the street and just have a real conversation with them, which not enough of us do, you know if this, and this is why the tragedy of thwarting democracy. Because if we have a real democracy, this country kicks ass because we are cool people. The problem is not with the American people. The problem is with institutions that are meant to be the channel through which our, our wisdom would emerge that are now uh, too, too blocked because of the undue influence of money and so forth. So it's up to us, each and every one of us, wherever you are, whoever you are talking to in whatever situation you're in, 
Be a teacher of God. Demonstrate a different way of being by simply living it. Sometimes it's something you say. Sometimes it's something you don't say. My friend was talking today, talking about a book. He said, I just put it on the table. The Course in Miracles says, you will be told if there's anything for you to say. In the book of Thomas, it, uh, uh, when Jesus says, go into the countryside, to his disciples, he said, go into the countryside and teach the gospel. He didn't mean hit people over the head with our book. To teach, the Course says, is to demonstrate. And the gospel is love. That's the priesthood. That if you, if, if, if you are a, a lawyer, you stand for justice. If you are an artist, your films, your artwork, whatever it is, it's the highest vibration of creativity and beauty. The Course in Miracles says you are on this earth to create the good, the true, and the beautiful. That's true if you're a receptionist. It's true if you're a doctor. It's true no matter what you do. Because your ministry is your dignity as a human being. You simply hold a different space. And you don't know who you're going to talk to. The Course in Miracles says that God will take care of that. And then when the disciples said to Jesus, <clears throat> what, will, what will we say? He said, go out into the countryside and teach the gospel. And they said, what will you say? And he's, his response is, I will tell you when you get there. So you and I have a job to do. And this is not only for our own lives to work, but also now collectively. Because this thing called American democracy, when America gets it right, we, we are a light unto the nations. But when we get it wrong, and we've gotten it wrong in recent years, and each and every one of us as citizens, it, it, the, the, that one of those enlightened principles that was enshrined is that it's the governing force of this country is supposed to be us. And we're fine. So when you see a situation where the, 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 the conduit by which our wisdom would emerge and be used as that governing force is thwarted, that's a very big deal. And Martin Luther King said, your life begins to end on the days you stop talking about things that matter. And we live in a society today in which there is such trivialization of wisdom. There is so much meaningless chatter. And when it comes to politics, the horse race. It's not about the horse race. It's not about the math. It's about ideas that matter. And in every generation, there are those who feel called. In every nation, there are those who feel called. And sometimes you feel called. Your calling to be a conduit for that which is best means repudiating and resisting that which is not, but which is everywhere. And I just want to make sure also that, you know, there's a study that I read. And this was particularly about women, but I think this would apply to men and women. And it was talking about how a lot of times women are afraid to speak up in a situation because they know that what they want to talk about goes against the grain of what the dominant system is. And if she expresses her opinion, somebody might just roll their eyes or say, you've been spending too much time at those seminars or what, did you go to California last weekend or whatever. <clears throat> and in this study, they take millions of dollars, you know, to study things that you and I could have like told them. And the study was, if even one other person, one other person will say, actually, I agree with her, then the whole system changes. And so if you not only to, if, if it is appropriate, obviously don't go be inappropriate or anything like that, but when it is the calling of your heart to say something that matters when everybody at the table or everybody in the situation, or even to ask the person around you, what, what's going on for them politically or whatever. Whatever the calling of your heart is to have a more meaningful rather than a meaningless conversation. And if somebody around you tries to do it and they get shouted down or even whispered down, it might be very subtle. Remember what I said before. The terrible things that have happened on this planet were not only that people did terrible things, but that too many people were too quiet for too long when those terrible things began to happen. So we, it is time I have felt so much over the last few years as I travel 
this country and this world. There are so many people. Sometimes people, somebody was saying the other day, we need more people to meditate. Well, actually, it's not that we necessarily need more people to meditate. Don't get too enamored with the myth of the majority. The majority didn't wake up one day and go, hmm, let's free the slaves, shall we? And the majority, the majority didn't wake up one day and say, let's give women the right to vote. Why not? That's not how social movements happen. It's ne society never moves forward because the majority wakes up and gets it. The majority, by definition, means the status quo, which means they're fine with what is. It's always because enough people, that hundredth monkey, that, that critical mass of people, stand in such conviction. Conviction is a force multiplier. So if you have a hundred people meditating, that's actually not as powerful in terms of force to actually make things happen as 10 people meditating deeply. So it's, and, and it also is not ours to monitor other people's progress. We have a full-time job, how deep am I today? How did I do today? And so what I feel, just my sense as I go around and I talk to people, it's so amazing what's happened. So many of us have read all the books now. So many of us have listened to the tapes now. But there's a way in which the era of data collection is over. Now is the time to practice what we know more consistently and with greater dedication. If, you know, somebody said to me the other day, what's Miriam, what's your practice? Like, you know, is, is it Vipassana? Is it the Course in Miracles workbook? It's all the same. The only practice that matters is that you seek to be a nicer person today than you were yesterday. That's the practice, that you seek to forgive today the person that you did not forgive yesterday. That's the practice, that you seek to atone and, and own your mistakes more than you did yesterday. Your practice is that you seek to meditate and to pray and to ask God's guidance more than you did yesterday. Your practice is that you seek to rise to the occasion in your life at a higher level, a more dignified level than before. We were talking last week about how our generation, our generation, it's unbelievable, everybody's so obsessed with what happened in their childhood, and yet our generation more than any other has neglected the children in our midst. So the way I see it is we all know this stuff now. Enough of us. We, I'm not saying that we don't want more people to meditate and more people to pray. Obviously, all the, it's beautiful the way all the stuff is becoming mainstreamed. But right now, we have such a critical mass of people who are already called to a different way. The Course in Miracles says salvation begins when we consider the possibility that there might be another way. And I believe there's so many people on the planet now. Wherever you go, you go to Africa, go to Af uh, Latin America, go to the Middle East, go to Asia, go to Europe, go to North America. I mean, it's everywhere. People shaking their heads and in their own way saying there must be another way. And God cannot, there's a saying in metaphysics, God cannot do for us what he cannot do through us. So as we wake up in the morning and ask, not only, dear God, show me another way, but make of me a vessel for the appearance of another way that the great work might be done through me, that in whatever field of endeavor I am, may I be of the priesthood there. May I be, if I work, if I don't work, in my parenting, in my friendships, in my whatever, as an employee, as an employer, and definitely now as citizens. Let us rise to the occasion. The Course in Miracles says that each and every one of us have unlimited potential to be used for the purpose of God's use of us for the salvation of the world. That is not arrogant. It is modest to know that. It is humble to know that. It's nothing you're taking personal credit for. And to the extent to which we give every day our lives and, and, and say the highest prayer, which is God use me, he will use us. And the things that will happen will be truly amazing to behold. We will self-correct in this nation and we will self-correct on this planet and the human species will find its heart, and the human species will evolve into a next place. And ultimately, whether this happens in our lifetime or not, is not only not known, but not even the issue. Uh, war will be eradicated, and all, every, all other modes of unnecessary uh, uh, human suffering, and all suffering of all life forms will be eradicated. Anything else is not worth your time to think about. Because that's the level. You decide for yourself, am I going to play it shallow or am I going to play it deep? And when you serve the ages, and when, pe when however all that works, beings and other realms or whatever, look down on you and know, whoa, you're playing it deep. You're playing it real. Wow, you're playing it big. 
those beings reach down and they help you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat>